Okay, I think it's 11 o'clock. Uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, part two in our series that is about um, application tuning. Although today is a little bit of a sidestep in the sense that we, we don't talk specifically about application tuning, but part of application tuning is also in a way to know um, over which things you have control and over which things you may not have as much control, but that you should be aware of. And this is why today's um, uh, uh, presentation is about HDF and, and sort of the many different corners and aspects. And there are some that are potentially detrimental uh, to performance, but you should be aware of them. And uh, if if possible, avoid them. And uh, so that's why we call HDF is an all-in-one package and there are good things and things that are not so great. Okay, um, the, uh, uh, so, so the, the topic more specifically is about variability in performance. And that is not just you are running the same thing multiple times, typically, um, you are dealing with um, parameterized uh, situations where you have parameters that you can choose, that you can adjust, and then you will get different responses. And um, what, what we would like to have is some kind of model um, to then explain this uh, connection between a stimulus and a response. And ideally, we would like to visualize that because that's sort of our strongest sense in a way. And um, from these visualizations, uh, it would be great if we could uh, uh, explain uh, what we are seeing. And uh, so, so today we'll, we'll take a step in that direction. And then if we see something uh, that we think we can explain, um, then we can think about, well, can we do something about it? Or if we cannot, how can we um, minimize the impact of that on our applications? And then of course, yeah, ideally uh, machines could be doing a lot of that for us, but uh, that's, that's into the future. Um, I have two portraits here or two, two uh, uh, pictures. One is of Louis Pasteur, uh, uh, and the quotation is, is his, uh, something that he said in a lecture, I think that applies to this kind of work. And the second is of Florence Nightingale, um, who uh, invented uh, a very nice uh, kind of visualization called a polar diagram or Nightingale uh, diagram. And we will see plenty of those today. Okay. Um, for, for those of you who have worked a little bit with HDF5, um, you will know uh, that as a user of, of HDF5 who just wants to get something done and HDF is just one of the many things that they have to deal with. They just want to use it and get on with their lives and solve real problems. They would like something that is really as simple as this uh, remote control that lets you do very basic things is when you want to watch television or something, you want to change, you want to turn the thing on or off. Uh, you might want to mute it, change channels, change volume. That's it. How difficult could that be? But once you then uh, look into the HDF5 API, uh, this is what you are presented with. You, you have something that also <laughs> goes under the name uh, remote control, but there are so many knobs and dials and so forth. And then it's not clear what some of them do. And um, do they relate to uh, the task that you are doing and so forth. So there is a real gap here. And that gap to a degree is filled by the ecosystem uh, around HDF5. So we have great work in the community with H5Pi, with Julia, with H5CPP and so forth that take away uh, a lot of that complexity. Um, but uh, that this is something to be aware of uh, that, that you are confronted with if you uh, start using HDF5. Now, um, speaking about performance variability more specifically, there are of course many sources for that. Um, one is the hardware itself, um, how your system is configured, 
um, concurrent activity uh, that is occurring uh, on that system, other users. Uh, but then there is, and, and you have very little control over that typically, but um, there is something that you have control over and that goes back to the, uh, to the buttons on that uh, more programmable, that elaborate remote control. There's a thing called HDF5 property list that lets you control the behavior of the library and it turns out that uh, last time I checked, I believe there were about 100, I think 91 <laughs> H5P set functions that H5P set something. And there are different groups of these property lists. Some have to do with the creation of objects. Some have to do with access uh, to objects and so forth. And if P sub I uh, would represent the number of different options, um, for that particular property, um, then as a very coarse estimate, uh, you could say there are P1 times and so forth times P100 combinations that are possible. And that's a huge number. Um, of course, not all of these combinations will be valid and so forth. That's why this is just a very rough estimate, but still it's a, it's a tremendous number. And then uh, you can look at that from all kinds of different angles, but as software developers, the, one of the first questions might be, well, how many of them are actually tested? <laughs> and um, then there is something, um, typically when you start uh, writing code, uh, these things may not be on the forefront of your mind, but nevertheless, since they are there, somebody will have made some choices for you um, for these parameters. And there is a thing called H5P default. And um, if you, you can start thinking about that, well, what does that really mean? And unfortunately, you don't have control over that. So if you say, I want my H5P default, not some unknown or some, something that someone decided, well, unfortunately, at the moment, you can't do that. But then the question is, okay, with that H5P default, the choices that were made, um, what kind of uh, performance can I expect from that? So in this whole H5P discussion, use the remote control metaphor or think of a space shuttle dashboard. There are all these knobs and dials. And in some cases, this can be overwhelming, especially to new users. And uh, yeah, it's just something, it's important to know something about that, but then depending on your task and depending on how deep you wanna get into this, um, uh, you, you, you have to know more, more or less about these things. Um, talking about models, so as you approach this, if we want to understand um, the performance variability, we need some kind of model. And the model is going back to Pasteur's quotations. That's sort of the prepared mind with which you have to approach the things that you will see and sometimes initially not understand. Um, and of course, we prefer simple models. And um, when we talk about performance variability, we need some kind of baseline, some kind of expected performance um, just on rational grounds, or uh, we will have some kind of a priori model. And the simpler that model is, the better. And in our case, in the sense of a polar diagram, as we will see in a moment, that will be a circle, which is about as simple as it can be. And um, this, is, uh, this is an unrelated example here, the snippet of Python code, and you don't have to understand it and read it now. But that basically illustrates that, yeah, when you see strange behavior like that, sometimes you have to know more than Python syntax and so forth. You have to know something about how floating point numbers are represented internally, how they are different languages on top of that do slightly different things and so forth. So, uh, that, that's all important to keep in mind. Now, um, so what we do uh, to study this perform performance variability, we choose something um, that looks like an application or that has a pattern that is very common maybe in many applications. And uh, we will use that application basically to stimulate, if you wish, the HDF5 library. And then we will see how the library behaves uh, in response uh, to that stimulus through execution time, through the size of the files uh, that we generate and so forth. 
And the application that we are using here is basically, we use something that is sort of stepped or time sequence. So we have a certain number of steps. We have a number of uh, two dimensional arrays in this case. So there will be a A, capital A count number of these two dimensional arrays. And then, yeah, these two dimensional arrays have a number of rows and a number of columns. And some typical numbers here are, let's say we do 20 steps, uh, we have 500 arrays per step and uh, each of these arrays is 100 by 200 and we are, we are dealing with 60 probic floating point numbers. And then since we will be doing this in parallel, uh, you can um, first of all do this in a, in a weekly or strongly scaled manner, meaning you can keep the per process I O load constant and just increase the number of processes, or you keep the uh, the total amount of data that you are reading or writing constant and just increase the number of processes and see how that scales. And in this particular example, the processes will be arranged in a two dimensional process grid. So if you have N MPI ranks, so to speak, we assume that N is sort of, uh, we can factorize that into, uh, let's say, n sub r uh, times n sub c for a number of row processes and number of column processes. And um, that's our setup. So number of time steps, first time step, number of arrays, and they are all two dimensional. And um, that's great. And it, it sounds like, well, what's the big deal? Uh, that should be pretty straightforward. That, that, that's true, but unfortunately, when we uh, try to express that in HDF5, there are many different ways how we can do that. And um, so, for example, these two-dimensional arrays, um, then, of course, we would need a little more context to uh, make a decision among these, uh, make a choice among these different options, would be what is your application that has such a pattern really doing? So if you had a very columnar access uh, to these two dimensional arrays, you might consider laying them out as many one dimensional data set per 2D array variable. You can write them as 2D array variables. You could compact them um, multiple uh, of these arrays into a three-dimensional data set. And then you have a choice in this three-dimensional data set, either time or, or the step number and the array number could be the, the leading dimension. Um, or you can compact them even further. You can create one large uh, four-dimensional data set, for example, uh, where again, then you have some choices. What are the two leading dimensions? Is it step number and array or the other way around? And um, there are other choices, but these are just sort of the obvious ones that come, come to mind. And among all these choices, in an ideal world, um, we, we would expect that no matter how we make these choices, uh, we would get more or less the same performance. Uh, but performance meaning measure wall time or measure, uh, pick your preferred performance measure. Um, but we would, uh, in an ideal scenario, uh, get the same execution time. And um, we, we've just gone out and implemented that with the exception of the 1D data set. We'll, we will be adding that shortly. But um, uh, if you go to GitHub, there is a link here. Uh, there is a, um, a, a small program called HDR5IO test that runs through uh, many different combinations and checks these things out. Okay, so just in terms of what do we measure here? So, well, first of all, we measure wall time, but then um, as we first write uh, all these arrays and then read them back, um, we can break down that wall time a little bit. Uh, for example, in the write phase, there's a write phase and a read phase, but even within that read and write phase, um, we, uh, we can, for example, measure how much time do we spend in creating objects, creating the file, creating the data sets, closing the file, and then the actual H5D write or H5D read in the read phase. And we just use uh, uh, simple MPI W time. And 
uh, we take, we record uh, the mins and max across MPI ranks. And then when we do repeated runs, we uh, just take the median uh, from these runs. But of course, for other fine choices, this is just one thing and um, uh, that can be adjusted uh, to record other things. Now, uh, talking of coming back to visualization, this is where our um, uh, um, uh, Nightingale uh, diagram comes in. Um, what we are basically doing is the following. Um, so these, the, the, the structure of these uh, Nightingale uh, diagrams is basically, we have two dimensions. One dimension is sort of the radius um, of this uh, circle. And uh, that's one, uh, one coordinate or one metric uh, that we could record. And that metric in our case will typically be something related to time, something related to time like wall time or something like that. And then there is an angular uh, component. Um, and in our case, as I said, um, in this case, we are interested in performance variability. So we are not that much interested in individual data points. We really, we want to see patterns across a range of parameters. If you remember the, the property lists and the many different choices that we can make for those, um, we really have sort of a sweep going around the angles here. We are sweeping somehow through this large parameter space not, not the uh, entire parameter space, but parameters that we think are important or that we want to include in a, in a sort of first exploration here. So two things, radius meaning metric and angle meaning combination of parameters. So if you take, for example, that point down here that's highlighted here, that could mean, well, obviously the, the radius. Uh, so this is between the four and five let's assume the um, unit here is seconds. So this would be like 4.57 seconds, that's this radius. But then this angle here could stand for a combination of parameters where we said, okay, we wrote to a four dimensional array, we used chunk layout, we used MPI IO collective operations. Um, that's for argument's sake, our parameter combination here and then, um, yeah, the radius indicates the, the wall time. And if we do that, uh, then uh, we might see uh, different types of curves. Again, this sort of brownish um, uh, circle here, this is in a way what I said earlier, that's kind of our baseline, that's ideal performance. We vary all these different parameters and the performance is actually unchanged. Now that of course would put into question, well, if we have all these parameters, but they give us the same execution time, what good are they for? <laughs> and and uh, we'll, as it will turn out that that's not the case, but nevertheless, from a performance perspective, it would be nice um, if we uh, came close uh, to that circle. But then of course there will be, we expect some noise, although again, we use the median uh, typically of multiple runs. So we would hope that would have some kind of calming or smoothing effect. Um, so it might be something more like this bluish line, or uh, we might see sort of interesting discrete uh, patterns. Uh, and the good news is with these um, uh, Nightingale or polar diagrams, that actually comes out very nicely and sort of our vision is kind of drawn because there's also there's this whole symmetry and we easily uh, discover sort of deviations from symmetry and so forth. And so that's our uh, visual, uh, uh, our visualization. And now let's put that to the test. So here's one example where um, this is not, not yet parallel, um, this is just using the default uh, POSIX VFD. Uh, we are measuring wall time in seconds. And um, again, this radial component here from zero, in this case, going up to seven, uh, that's zero seconds to seven seconds. And um, in this case, we chose 48 um, uh, different parameter sets. And I'm, I'm not gonna, but, but it is things like varying whether we are writing to a two dimensional, whether we are writing multiple two-dimensional arrays, whether we are writing to three-dimensional arrays, whether we are writing to one, 
four-dimensional arrays, um, uh, varying the layout, uh, compact and uh, not compact in this case, but chunked and contiguous and so forth. And then each data point here uh, represents the median of five runs. So we ran each combination five times and then just took the median of the wall time or uh, some of these other times in the breakdown. And um, we could have factored that into the parameters, uh, but, but in this case, we call them out by color. We use different library versions. So we used 1.8.22, 1.10.7, 1.12.0, 0, and at the time uh, develop. And um, what do we see? Well, um, we see some variability, um, meaning this is not, uh, not this nice circular line uh, that, that represents our baseline. Um, we also see that toward the end here, um, we are, this is not exactly a spiral, but it's sort of turning inward a little bit. So the execution time, again, radius represents execution time. It's a little faster or shorter uh, than here, but uh, really not, not that large. And, um, but overall, uh, this actually doesn't look too bad uh, compared to a circle. Now, uh, the question is, how do we explain it? Can we explain it? Um, uh, certainly the POSIX driver is uh, over the years highly optimized and so forth. Um, that, uh, uh, that's one argument. It doesn't really explain anything, but that's one argument. But then again, it, it begs the question, well, what do we need all these parameters for if they seem to have no, no effect here? And of course, uh, now we would have to talk about, well, what is really happening under the covers here, the size of the parameters. In, in this case, of course, there's buffered IO going on and so forth. So you have to really drill down deeper, but this is an interesting starting point. But now with these numbers, remember, we can break down wall time uh, into a sort of read phase and write phase and so forth. So if we dig a little deeper, it turns out the picture uh, changes a little bit, but before I do that, just contrast that um, with something that, of course, I used the POSIX VFD in the previous example, and uh, there are other single process uh, VFDs available, such as the core VFD, for example. Um, we are measuring the exact same thing, same parameter combinations, median of five runs, and so forth, but this doesn't look any more like a circle. Um, this, this, this really looks like this rather spiky in places thing, more like a porcupine. And um, the variability is, is quite pronounced. And um, it turns out that if, if I, but then this would be too busy, if you would superimpose the POSIX figure onto this or the POSIX uh, lines onto this, uh, the innermost line, which corresponds to HDF5 1822 is actually pretty close to the, to the POSIX line, um, which is also very close to buffered IO because given the underlying problem size and so forth, this with buffered IO, this whole thing runs pretty much in memory. So, so the performance should be pretty much identical or pretty close to, to the core VFD. But um, on the downside, it also appears as if um, sort of going from black 1822 to green 1107 to 112 to develop, there seems to be a little bit of a progression, or in this case, it's not a progress, it's a progression in radius, but a regression in performance um, going on. And remember, uh, this, this is the median of five runs. This is not just a single data point per parameter combination, it's five runs. So again, we would hope that this median or averaging, depending on which metric you choose, would have a calming effect, but it seems to have um, not exactly the opposite effect, but it doesn't have seem to have that effect here at all. Now, I told you that, um, so going back to our POSIX figure here, now let's drill down a little deeper into what's going on in the right phase, what's going on in the read phase, because on the surface, this looks great, but if we dig down deeper, is that really, um, does that carry over into these individual phases? And so here we are looking at the read phase. So again, 
what we are doing is a number of steps. We are writing for each step a number of two-dimensional arrays, and we first write them, and then we read them back, and uh, we do that five times and take the median. So if we just focus on the read phase here, uh, this is what we see. Um, we, uh, we see kind of a pattern, which is good. Uh, this is what these polar diagrams is for. It's also, it's called read phase max. It's a single process run here, but this is just an artifact of sort of pulling out the column names to construct this diagram. What we see since radius means uh, read phase time in this case, this is sort of a slow time here starting at zero degrees. Uh, so performance is slower, slower. I mean, it oscillates, so, so there is variability here. It sort of improves and it's actually pretty good down here. So, uh, apologies. Um, it's pretty good down here, sort of in this around 135 degrees, but then it gets worse again, jumps up uh, and then comes back and recovers. So um, what's, what's going on here? Uh, well, first of all, the total variance is amazing. So here we are looking at 0.2 and out here we are looking sort of in the 0.6 range. Uh, so that's a factor of three, um, that's quite substantial. And um, that, that hint of regression uh, that we think we saw uh, with the core BFD is also here because again, black is 1822, green is 1107, yellow is 1120 and then red is developed. Uh, so that appears to be there to a degree. And um, there appear to be sort of three types of regions. Um, this, this first region here, let's say from zero to roughly 60 degrees, then from 60 to let's say 120, um, then from 120 to almost 180, and then again. So how would we explain that? Well, um, now, of course, would be the time to dig in a little bit into what do these angles, which stand for parameter combinations, what do they really uh, mean? And um, as, as I said earlier, in terms of parameter combinations, the things that we change here is um, the, dim the dimensionality or the rank of the arrays that we are writing to, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, but then we also vary things like contiguous layout, chunk layout, and so forth. And then the question would be, you know, if I pick this 315 uh, degree parameter, for example, what is the rank here? Um, well, I happen to know that the rank here is four, but uh, so, and, and, and this is a, is a degree of challenge here with this type of visualization. Uh, if a given uh, angle, really stands for a backdoor of different parameter choices. I haven't yet mastered to visualize that in a very elegant and very intuitive way. But uh, let's take a look here. So um, what I'm showing here is, um, uh, uh, is different from what I showed earlier, uh, because here I'm looking purely at array rank. So the radial component here does not mean time. It really means array rank. And okay, having floating point numbers here is a little artificial because as I said earlier, we have only three array ranks that we are dealing with. We have two dimensional, um, we have three dimensional uh, arrays and a four dimensional array that we are writing to. So ideally, um, and I'm just showing my uh, lack of mastery here with the, uh, with the plot package. Um, ideally, I would superimpose this picture here onto this picture. And if I did that, what you would see is that, yeah, um, this first pizza slice here, so to speak, uh, this is where we are writing to two dimensional arrays. This next slice is where we are writing to uh, three dimensional arrays. And then this last slice here is, oh, right, I, I apologize. I said writing, this is about reading. Um, so where we are reading from uh, four dimensional arrays and then it flips over again. Here we are reading again from um, two dimensional arrays. Here we are reading from three dimensional arrays and here we are reading from a single four dimensional arrays, array. And that of course 
um, explains part of this figure. It explains this sort of what I call this spiraling in effect. If you if you ignore these uh, these jumps here, uh, we are sort of spiraling in to better read performance, and then we have a repeat of that pattern. So my my first explanation uh, of this figure would be to say, oh yeah, it looks like the rank um, uh, from which the rank of the array uh, from which we are reading um, is critical, but it cannot explain these these sort of these kinks, these these um, uh, these jumps in performance because the array rank here is two everywhere. So there must be at least one other parameter that can explain this, these ups and downs. Okay, so um, if we do that, and, and maybe before we find that other parameter, it's, it's always a good, a good test to look at another VFD to see if the behavior is similar. And it turns out, yeah, if we focus just on the read phase uh, with the core VFD, we see a similar pattern. It doesn't look exactly like this. So the, um, the, 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 the depth or the size of these jumps is not as pronounced um, with the core VFD, but nevertheless, that pattern is there. And the pattern of this slightly sort of spiraling in is also there that we get, as we know now, um, that the performance seems to be uh, poorer with uh, when reading from two-dimensional arrays, it gets better with three and even better with four-dimensional arrays and then a repeat of this pattern. We also see that hint of regression. We also see that, yeah, there must be at least one other parameter here that uh, can help us explain where these jumps are coming from. Okay, in order to explain these jumps, and again, I sort of looking at the parameter space and from experience, we kind of know uh, where to look. And this diagram is similar to this diagram in the sense that I'm not showing execution time here. I'm just plotting, as I said, another uh, factor that we are varying here is alternating or not alternating, but sort of changing the layout of these data sets. So we are writing two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional, but then, of course, in HDL5, we have a choice uh, of storage layout. It could be uh, contiguous, uh, which it will be by default. We can make a chunk. There are other options with virtual and, and uh, compact and so forth, but they don't apply in this case. And so it turns out here, again, the radial component uh, has only two relevant values one and two, and I chose to represent one as chunk layout and two as contiguous layout. And so what that means uh, for, our, uh, for our angles is starting here at zero degrees, our first run um, or our first parameter set uh, to be more precise, our first parameter set, uh, set starts with chunk layout the second parameter set is chunk layout. Then we change that to contiguous layout, uh, another contiguous layout back to chunk, chunk, contiguous, and so forth. So that creates this, call it a sawtooth or gear tooth uh, pattern. And again, uh, my apologies for my poor mastery um, of this tool. If you superimpose that, for example, on this picture, uh, I, so ideally I would superimpose this picture onto this picture. And then if you did that, you would see this nice alignment between these jumps and uh, the change in layout. So for these two points, for example, here, this is chunk layout, this is chunk layout, then we change to contiguous layout, contiguous layout, chunk layout, chunk layout, contiguous, and so forth. And just to, uh, in a way to prove that to you, what you can do is now you can say, well, if if my my assertion is true that the change in layout really causes this tooth pattern, um, if I uh, just restrict myself to one or the other, so I plot only contiguous runs and 
change all other parameters or I plot only chunked runs and uh, varied, then this, these curves should actually smooth. And uh, this is indeed what happens. So here on this uh, picture, I show on the left-hand side, again, it's just a read phase. Um, it's only chunk layout. So all other parameters are still varying, but it's just chunk layout. And over here, it's just contiguous layout and all other parameters varying. And indeed, um, all our, uh, uh, all these teeth, so to speak, um, are gone. So that has some explanatory power. Um, what we also see is that um, there, there, there is still uh, that seeming uh, regression pattern there that, yeah, the black line, the 1A22 is a pretty good performer or, or more or less the leader across the board, maybe with the exception of this last uh, segment here. And, um, and it's most pronounced in now uh, we talked about the layout, but then again, this is the rank two the rank three, the rank four, the rank two again, rank three, rank four. This is most pronounced um, in the rank two uh, world. Now, um, that's all great. So this is just to give you an idea um, after looking at these diagrams and making these selections on these parameters. These are the kinds of um, insights, uh, hopefully, um, that you can gain. Now, let's look at some parallel runs. Um, so uh, for, for the parallel runs, what I did is um, uh, we want some kind of baseline. And um, I'm using H5P default. So that would mean, in this case, contiguous layout, independent operations, things like that. And um, what we are plotting here um, are strong scaling results. So strong scaling results means um, we, we keep the, the total, uh, the number of steps, number of arrays and the dimensions of these arrays fixed, but um, we change the number of MPI ranks. So in this case, we are uh, exploring up to four MPI ranks and then the possible topologies. Remember, we have to arrange our processes in a process row times process column grid. So for four MPI ranks, um, four MPI rank doing one, two, four. Um, we could do a one by one uh, for one, one by two, two by one for two MPI ranks, or one by four, two by two, and four by one um, for uh, four MPI ranks. And again, we measure the same thing. Um, we take the median of five runs. Um, in this case, I just took a cloud instance, the pretty normal EC2 instance. Uh, that has two SSDs attached. So this is not a parallel file system. Uh, uh, basically there are two SSDs. So you can just put a rate zero over, to, over those two. That doesn't give you a tremendous amount of uh, parallelism and so forth, but, but it's as good as you can do. And what you see is still, um, even for this baseline, so unlike in the case of the POSIX driver, um, there is tremendous variability here. Again, uh, radius here means time. So we are looking at a range from, um, in the best case down here, I would say between somewhere three and four out to sort of your yeah, 10 uh, maybe range. So again, roughly a factor of three. And uh, this is wall time. This is not just the read phase or the write phase, this is wall time. In this case, I've also chosen only to go with 1A22 and uh, develop or 113.0 at this point. And um, the question is, well, how do, we, how do we explain this? And of course, we have seen some suspects already uh, like the array rank playing with the layout and so forth, but um, uh, there's perhaps more going on here. Now, um, here is uh, another example. So as I said earlier, this is with H5P default, uh, which means contiguous layout. Um, it means independent operations, independent reads and writes. And here is something where we, for example, the only thing that we changed was using collective operations instead of um, independent operations. And 
what you see is actually a tremendous uh, reduction in variability and it just shows that collective operations, especially for small numbers of processes, uh, can work. You see our the sort of the range of variability narrows down to, I would say, between maybe four and six. So again, here it was between uh, three something, close to four and 10, uh, we dropped down to um, between four and six. And sure, there is some variability and so forth, and this is not uh, not a perfect circle, but it's actually pretty good. And collective operations seem to work. Now let's vary something else. So, for example, um, we switch to instead of using the default uh, contiguous layout, let's switch to chunk layout. Um, so, if we switch to chunk layout. Um, performance actually gets even better there because here we, we get much, much closer to that three line. Um, uh, variability is uh, in about the same range. Um, uh, but of course, now these, um, these spikes are more pronounced again. And then the question is, well, uh, where are they coming from? But uh, we, we have, of course, our usual suspects. It, it can't be the layout because uh, we, we fixed that to chunk. But of course, we, we still have the dimensions varying uh, from two to three to four. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, clearly chunking helps. And if we ask ourselves, well, why, why would chunking uh, make such a big difference? Well, it has to do with... Um, uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a figure here, but if you have a two-dimensional array and you know that that two-dimensional array is partitioned um, over a two-dimensional process grid, and then these processes will be writing to or reading from th this partitioned process grid, then you have sort of a case where, um, let's, let's stick with four ranks. For example, we have the one by four, the two by two, and the four by one. So in the case of where we have one process row and four process columns, um, um, that's uh, potentially trouble because um, process one will be writing the first row of its partition, and then it will have to seek back uh, to the beginning of its, uh, of its partition in the file, write the next row and so forth. So there's quite a bit of seek overhead. Likewise, for all the other ranks in uh, dimension uh, in two by two, that's not as severe and it kind of goes away in uh, four by one. If we have four process rows uh, and uh, just one process columns, then each process can just nicely write away. Um, uh, that, that, of course, goes away with chunking because each process will then write its full chunk and uh, there, there is no no seeking going on and so forth. So that, that would explain why uh, chunking helps in this case. Um, we can make that even better uh, if we um, uh, skip the initialization. So again, you can, if you just keep an eye on the radius here, which stands for uh, execution time, for wall time, um, uh, it gets better and better because we know that uh, as part of the uh, default uh, property list, the uh, uh, when you uh, create a data set, usually when uh, the underlying layout, be it chunked or contiguous, is created, it is initialized with fill values or zero fill values in that, depending on the element type. In the case of the chunks, but also in the contiguous case here, we know that we are going to overwrite that full chunk. So there's no real point in initializing it because initializing is additional writing. So in a way, uh, with the default properties, we are writing <laughs> the same amount of data twice where the first write is kind of uh, pointless because uh, the same values get overwritten in the, in, the, in the second write. So if we disable that writing with property lists, um, then uh, performance gets better. And that's what we are seeing here. So we are doing effectively uh, 
pure rights. So um, again, and there are some new things that we see in parallel with small ranks. And depending on the scaling, you will see, and there will be a part three and a part four uh, to this series of talks. So next time we'll talk about parallel and uh, scaling to larger numbers of ranks. And then in part four, we'll do this in the cloud. Um, but you see that starting from a simple sequential run, there are all kinds of things that you can discover about how the library behaves and that behavior may or may not um, uh, be to your expectation or to, to anybody's expectations, not, not just you uh, personally. Um, so, so this is just the beginning. Um, we, are, we are sort of trying to, uh, 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 yeah, uh, make that more systematic, organize that material a little better. Um, I can only apologize for the amateurish quality of the figures because, yeah, you can spend a lot of time making the figures perfect, and I, I just didn't have the time. Uh, but that will be better, I think, in the future. I think um, what this at least shows is that um, with the right kind of visualization, uh, you can uh, simplify, you can, uh, you can uh, show things so that they are really evident um, that uh, it's then just a matter of, yeah, you see something, you see a pattern, uh, and it's then a matter of, well, can you explain it? And since you then have the numbers, the underlying numbers for that visualization, um, you can then test your explanation against all the other data. Uh, that you have. And yeah, this is not really about to say, oh, um, uh, a change was introduced here or there, and that's why the performance is so bad. And it's not that simple, actually. This is, and, and keep in mind, this is just one um, Mickey Mouse application in, in, in a sense. I mean, it is a common pattern, but it's not a real application. And, but it's about raising awareness, raising awareness of, um, uh, the, the, the HDF5 is highly configurable, and um, unfortunately, as 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 we have seen, there are many ways to do one thing, and uh, that that comes with um, that 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 is an advantage, but it can also be challenging, especially um, for new users. And so you could say that, yeah, this is a Mickey Mouse application, so it's a simple thing. And simple things should be simple. But um, on the flip side, you could also argue, well, it should be hard to get simple things wrong. And unfortunately, that's not the case, as we have seen. It is very easy <laughs> to get just because you, um, when you, when you write an application like that, you have good reasons to prefer two-dimensional arrays over three-dimensional arrays or four-dimensional arrays or the other way around. There are many more motivating factors and constraints that the develop, developer of an application faces uh, when they decide on a, on a layout or how they want to structure uh, their HDF5 file. And um, unbeknown, maybe unbeknownst to that, uh, there are there is potentially a penalty for that choice or um, uh, and then uh, you either know that trick or that knob that lets you recover uh, from that uh, drop in performance that the default properties would give you. But again, it's not, it's not as straightforward as we wish it would be. And so unfortunately, it's, it's easy to get simple things wrong. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so j just going back to uh, having having many ways uh, to do one thing is, is kind of a mixed blessing. And uh, yeah, there, there's no, no magic wand or that, that we have to make that go away. Um, you can also talk about um, mitigating risk in this context, risks that you can identify and then uh, which steps you can take um, to, to deal with that risk. And unfortunately, in HDF5 itself, um, that, that is a very uneven uh, situation at the moment that in 
on the surface, as we just saw it, it's really more of an assume accept uh, thing where you just assume and accept the risk for you on behalf of your users, so to speak. And I, I would say that wasn't even a conscious decision and, and that's not good. Um, uh, in some cases you can avoid risk. Uh, so for example, uh, take a thread safe build of the library. That's how you consciously uh, avoid that risk of um, um, having side effects or corrupting something or, or just not behaving correctly in a multi-threaded context. Um, in some cases, uh, you have explicit uh, parameters to control certain risks, uh, take the swim or retry count, for example, or you can transfer the risk onto the user uh, of that feature as you can do with direct chunk IO. Hey, if you think uh, you can do a lot better or it uh, simplifies your application, your workflow, your life, um, if you can directly access chunks, read them or write them, the risk is on you, uh, we do it. Um, if you think you know what you're doing, do it. Um, or then uh, things like uh, watching, monitoring risk, uh, MDC logging and so forth. But again, this, the fact that it's so uneven that maybe it's poor against 96% is, um, is not good. Um, maybe I'm gonna uh, skip this slide um, to, to have some time for questions. Um, next steps. Um, I think it's important to automate all this. This was really a lot of manual work, uh, running these tests, okay, uh, creating the figures and so forth. So I think we want to package this a little nicer. Um, also, um, it makes sense to uh, embed this kind of a performance regression into or variability um, into a framework like, like Google test. Um, then it's a question of um, how much coverage makes sense uh, for this parameter space of property lists and to really avoid uh, being in a situation where, well, yeah, with 91 and counting um, uh, properties, it's very easy that uh, whatever has the limelight of the day that um, months later people start forgetting about this corner or that corner or there's one guy or one gal that remembers, oh, didn't we do this 10 years ago uh, in this thing and so forth. I think that's not, not a good strategy. Well, it's not a strategy at all. It's not a good thing to do. Um, there's also very interesting work uh, going on in the community. For example, um, Stephen Varga's effort in H5CPP and creating uh, randomized structures randomized HDL5 structures based on, on these pre for sequences, very interesting work. And then of course, yeah, better visualization, we want to automate that visualization pipeline. And then yeah, it's, it's just not um, a, a, a good proposal to say, even once we have automated all that, um, it's um, Joe not referring to anybody specifically, it's Joe's task to check every day at seven o'clock in the morning last night's results and if something changed or the pictures look different and so forth. Um, let's let's let computers take care of that and send you an alert when when something is there, something is happening that uh, deserves our attention, but otherwise this should be all just running on its own. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks for your attention and I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions that might be out there. Hello. Hello, Eva. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can I ask a question now? Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, nice talk, but I, I, I'm sorry I missed some initial part. I was somewhere, but uh, so I use this uh, collective buffering operations and data save a lot in my uh, application, and I have always found it extremely challenging to come down to the right set of Romeo parameters, for example, striping and what not to do. And I mean, it really I can tell you that it then changes with the machine which we use, the supercomputer shifts and that changes. 
So is there any kind of inbuilt HDF uh, utility which can basically like I can run it on a machine before I tune it on my application and say that, okay, this is the right kind of thing to do here? Yes, I think you are putting your finger right on the spot. Um, and and uh, we, we, we've spoken about uh, that in the group. And this is actually, I, I, it's not on the list here, next steps, but um, it is on our minds and uh, we, we would like to act on it. In a sense, what we have in mind is, is, as you say, this is very machine specific, very setup specific. So ideally, what you get uh, when you go to a machine, okay, you get a the vendor specification sheet that that says okay this is how many process of this that blah 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 that's great um but what you want in addition to that is really for any piece of middleware or software that you depend on you would like a similar kind of performance envelope or or sort of caution uh, uh, note that says okay for this machine based on this reference uh, uh, application, be it HDF5 IO test or be it something else, it doesn't matter. Um, that basically says, okay, after running uh, uh, this test um, on this machine, we found that sort of this is kind of the green range. It's not gonna be one number obviously, but it will be sort of ranges of parameters where we say, okay, um, uh, these, these are the ranges in which you will get closest to what the vendor uh, says the performance uh, that the system is capable of achieving. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, we, uh, that, I think we are, we are in complete agreement there. It is very system specific and we need to do a better job to, to show you how an HDF5 library or even different versions of the library behave in that specific environment. Uh, thanks. I, I just have, uh, can I continue uh, this sure. small sure. question I have? I mean, it would be, for example, like I'm sure there are many, many application developers all over the world trying the same set of things. Is it a place where I can kind of look for this HDF5 wisdom? Like, you know, the platforms are different, but many platforms are similar as well at the same time. Is there a place where I can say, look up the right set, at least at the current status of the thing, for example. Yeah, uh, to, to my knowledge, that site doesn't exist, but <laughs> it would be something like the, um, not the top 500, there's also the IO 500, a resource like that, where or the, the stream benchmark, some of uh, these benchmarks, they have websites where people are invited to submit results and something along those lines maybe where people yeah of course then it's a question of a normalization because you want to understand well uh, did they run the same thing or how does what they ran uh, compare or relate uh, to, to my thing and and yeah if we had one application or a set of kernels where we say like the uh, the, uh, the NAS benchmarks in the old days or something like that where people would run the NAS parallel benchmarks and then submit results for different systems. And yeah, so I think that that would be a great thing. And I'm, I'm sure we will um, uh, work in that direction to really make it more practical. And, and that's just the first step. Of course, the burden would still be on the user to find that resource and use that resource. So it, it, it's not gonna solve the problem in the sense that out of the box, um, of course, then you could have maybe an accompanying uh, uh, like, like benchmark application that you, you would run uh, before and, and then and like profile uh, guided uh, optimization and so forth, something that would then work in tandem uh, with your application. So there are just many different ways to do that. But yes, absolutely. I think uh, you are uh, spot on there. Uh, thanks, Heber. Thank for your answer. It, it was uh, nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We got, I think, at least 30 more seconds, if not more. And then, of course, there's the forum. So if you have, if anybody has other questions and so forth, we will, uh, can, we can pick this up on the forum. Uh, yes, I have a question if we have time. Uh, this is uh, Marta Garcia. Um, first, I want to thank you. It was a 
an excellent presentation. I love your graphs, so don't <laughs> be uh, worried about it. They were very useful. And um, so it's related to the um, uh, impact of other elements uh, that are part of machines, like for example, a striping uh, uh, or SSD or burst buffers. Um, uh, I'm currently testing for a particular run and I'm seeing uh, a variability. So is five samples enough? Uh, you sample uh, five times, but uh, compute time sometimes is expensive. Uh, so I was wondering where is the right limit? Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be variability. Where, where do you stop? Especially if you have to perform a lot of tests and they are not in one node, but in, in 500 nodes or things like that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a statistician to begin with. So um, uh, I think five is a starting point. It's probably not sufficient. I think it just depends on, uh, from experience, for example, I found that if you do this in the cloud, variability actually tends to be pretty low in the cloud uh, for whatever reason. I mean, you pay money for it. It's not that, okay, if you use a, a supercomputing center, the taxpayer paid for the acquisition of the system and so forth. But in the cloud, when a cloud provider tells you this is what you get in terms of resources, then people would be taking the money elsewhere if they didn't get that. Or so, but from experience, I found that in cloud-based system, that variability tends to be pretty low, despite all the other activities going on and um, so I, the, I usually choose that how many uh, repetitions I do by just getting a sense of how busy is that system. Once I've done five, what is the variability in this five? So what's the, for example, the difference between the median and the average? If the, the difference between the median and the average is large, that would tell you that, yeah, there are lots of outliers or, or something happened on that system. So. It's, uh, I think, again, it's, it's system dependent, but uh, there are certain indicators, like, for example, the difference between median and average um, that might tell you that you are on the low side as far as numbers of samples goes. But generally, yeah, it's the number of combinations of parameters and the, um, uh, uh, the uh, number of samples that quickly adds up to this humongous uh, 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 workload that you have to go through, you have to go through it in a sense, you have to wait for it. I mean, the machine does it all for you, but you have to wait for it and that adds a delay to it. And yeah, so I, yeah, I don't have any perfect answer. No, thank you, that was useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think my apologies, time is up, but uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, let's keep the discussion and yeah, we will, of course, keep the community up to date as we develop new things, maybe create a repository where people can submit results and then see how we can organize that and really share it and, and share some useful information. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. I will post this on the forum early next week when I get the recording process. Thank you. Mm -hmm.